Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at VAFB.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce the wonderful local products we enjoy. Brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Virginia's Agriculture in the Classroom program is offering free online curriculum to help parents looking for enriching activities for kids out of school. Virginia rockfish is delicious, especially with this special recipe. And the future for some farms could be indoors. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always. Welcome back to Real Virginia, everyone. We're coming to you this week from the Great Big Greenhouse in Chesterfield County. Burke Muller reports free agriculture related teaching aids and videos are available online for students stuck at home this spring. With the coronavirus outbreak forcing nearly everyone to stay home as much as possible, many parents are looking for ways to keep their children engaged. And that's where Agriculture in the Classroom has you covered. Today we're in my backyard and we're actually going to be starting some seeds in the greenhouse. Facebook Live events have allowed Agriculture in the Classroom staff to interact and demonstrate lessons. In addition, the organization is helping parents and kids find their own material. Our family packets are called Ag Sunday, which we're putting out each Sunday afternoon, which will consist of a read aloud, a lesson or activity, and then something for families to take home. Maxie anticipates the Facebook campaigns will be available at least until mid-May. In addition to the Facebook posts and family packets, Agriculture in the Classroom has resources on YouTube that are popular with second grader Owen Black and his mother Lynn. Farm Life 360 is shot with 360 cameras, which allow users to find the parts of the video that interest them. So now, once he's picked his favorite, now he can explore all around and actually feel like he is sitting in the tractor with the farmer while he's harvesting peanuts. The Virginia Agriculture in the Classroom Facebook page recently received 40,000 page views in a week, three times more than usual. But like many page visitors, Lynn and Owen haven't limited agricultural learning to what's on the computer. So we went outside and we took a nature walk and we found different things that are growing around us. Uh, we did this after we saw what the Virginia farmers grow all around the state and then we decided, all right, what's growing right around in our backyard? And so we did the bottle cap investigation lesson where we went outside and found things that would fit inside the bottle cap that then we could investigate and learn about. So so those are things that we that take us outside, give us something to do to get us outside the house a little bit, but they all tie back into stuff that he was already learning in school. In Northumberland County, teacher Tammy Wilkins incorporates agriculture in the classroom in all of her instruction. Despite school being closed, she's keeping her students involved in projects they were working on before everyone was told to stay home. For my students that have been involved here in the greenhouse and with the raising of chickens and the hatching, send them photos about once a week to let them know the progress of what's happening and where we are in the greenhouse and with the chickens. A lot of parents are looking for anything they can find to help these kids to continue learning. Um, I think if we can get them in touch with Ag in the classroom, they could do lessons with younger kids and older kids at the same time, which would certainly make things easier for them. For a comprehensive list of all the resources Agriculture in the Classroom has to offer, go to www.agclassroom.org forward slash VA. Under the Teachers tab, you'll find lesson plans, an interactive Virginia map, recommended books, Farm Life 360, and many other offerings for parents and students. The page is also featured on a new web portal created by the Virginia Farm Bureau with resources to help farmers and others in agriculture in these unprecedented times. In Northumberland County, I'm Burke Moeller reporting. Virginia's Agriculture in the Classroom program is just one of dozens of online curriculum and lesson plan resources linked to agriculture. 
Many other State Farm Bureau organizations also have similar resources online. More are available at the American Farm Bureau Foundation for Agriculture website, agfoundation.org. You can also visit myamericanfarm.org for games and other educational resources and to learn about agriculture careers. Individual farmers are also reaching out to the public on their own social media pages, offering virtual tours of their farms and an intimate look at how our food is raised. I'm Mark Viette. Coming up on In the Garden, I'm going to talk about pruning butterfly bush and one of my favorites, beautyberry. Stay with us. Farm Bureau is the insurance provider of choice for farmers. But did you know all Virginians can benefit? In fact, most of our members are not farmers. As a member, you are supporting worthy causes like local Virginia food banks and the Agriculture in the Classroom program. Your $40 membership will easily pay for itself with our many savings options. Farm Bureau is made for Virginians. Get the membership advantage by going to vafb.com or contact your local Farm Bureau. If you want to see new blooms on many trees and shrubs, you need to prune away the old growth. Mark Viette shows us the best way how on two popular plants in the garden. This is a neglected butterfly bush and it's not been pruned for many years. There are a couple problems when you don't prune butterfly bushes. They get too tall or certain parts of them die back and you have to go in by hand and prune them. And what also happens is some of the growth at the base gets really big. What I find in some of those colder areas when we get really cold temperatures, if you don't prune your butterfly bush year after year, uh, sometimes the whole plant will die or three quarters of it will die. I'll show you how to prune butterfly bushes. It's pretty easy, but you need to do it every spring. I find in colder temperatures, the butterfly bushes that are pruned closer to the ground sometimes survive more. The difference between pruning a butterfly bush at 18 inches from the ground or six inches from the ground means that it's about a foot, foot and a half shorter when you prune it closer to the ground. The best time of year to do it again is mid-spring around April. And if you look, most of these are cut six inches from the ground. So just go on down. It's very easy with the loppers. And I'm gonna prune mine at about six inches from the ground. And you know what I sometimes do? I do a comparison. I'll take one plant and I'll cut one at 18 inches and I'll cut one at six inches or lower. And if you do this, you're going to have a beautiful butterfly bush coming into full flower all season long. This is the white beauty berry, also known as Calicarpa alba. It's upright. It gets tall taller than me. So I don't prune this really low to the ground. So just come in and take your hand pruners just like this and you can see we're pruning it at 24 inches and you just prune just like this. Now the reason you can do this in the spring is this plant blooms on new wood and then produces the beautiful pure white porcelain berries for the fall. This is the purple beauty berry. It's the weeping form, which I love. Not too big for the garden. And again, you come in with your hand shears and I like to bunch it up, makes it easy. And you just come right in and prune it at about 24 inches from the ground. And this plant will produce new growth like you see here in the spring, flower, and then berry in the fall. I'm Mark Viet. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Hi, I'm Chef Tammy Brawley with Virginia Heart of the Home. Coming up next, 
salt-crusted rockfish caught from Virginia's beautiful Chesapeake Bay. We hope you'll stay tuned. And now, a sneak peek into a day in the life of a Virginia dairy cow. They get their day started. They have some lunch. Get some exercise. Spend time with their friends. And then end their day with dairy sweet dreams. Real dairy, real life, real delicious. Chesapeake Bay Rockfish is a delicious entree. Chef Tammy Brawley shows us how to prepare it with just a pinch of salt in the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Chef Tammy Brawley with Heart of the Home. We're here at Meadow Event Park today and we're gonna work with some gorgeous rockfish caught in our great Chesapeake Bay just a couple of days ago. First thing we wanna do is we have a large serving bowl and yes, it does require a lot of salt, but it's great. We're gonna pour all of the salt, it's about two pounds, you really want to think about how, how much your fish weighs to do this recipe. This uh, rockfish um, we have is about three to five pounds. I've got two pounds of kosher salt and I've got six egg whites. We're going to mix in the egg whites in our salt. Get in here just like this. Nice and thorough mixture. Kind of sticky. It reminds me of snow cream when I was growing up. We want to put some salt crust on our pan. Then we're going to move this gorgeous bad boy over to the pan. We're going to open it up and we're going to stuff it with those lemon slices and the fresh thyme. So we've got it stuffed with our thyme and our lemon slices, and now we're going to totally encase it in this salt crust. You don't have to worry so much about the tail or the head, but you definitely want to get that body encased. And if you feel like you need more salt, you can certainly do that. I personally think this is a perfect amount. It's already starting to kind of feel sticky, kind of like a clay to a certain extent. There we go, this is absolutely beautiful. We're gonna pop this into the oven for about 30 minutes and then it's gonna get nice and brown and then we're gonna um, break open that crust and we're gonna see the most delicious, most tender fish. One of the things that I love about this recipe is um, I have friends that live in Matthews and we did this recipe there at their house and my friend's husband was um, out in the middle of Chesapeake Bay catching the fish. He calls me on the phone and said he was catching red drum and rockfish, what did I want? And I said, oh, a rockfish, please. Um, he pulls the boat up gets off, um, cleans my fish, walks into the kitchen and hands me a fresh fish. So if you have a fisherman like that, um, he's a treasure to have. So keep that in mind. And we're going to pop this in the oven and we're going to come back in about a half an hour. All right, so we were in a 425 degree convection oven for about a half an hour. We've let the fish rest and now it's time for the magic. We're going to move the fish over to the large cutting board. And I'm not sure if you can hear that, but it is hard as it should be. I keep wanting to say meringue because when you cook uh, egg whites, they become meringues. It's not really meringue, it's just egg whites and salt as you saw me do earlier. Now, here is the fun part. First of all, it's going to be messy, um, but to me, anything good is always gonna be messy. Um, for those of you that have a meat tenderizer in your kitchen, it's the perfect thing to use. If you don't have a meat tenderizer, you can always use a handy dandy hammer, which is what we're gonna do. Keep in mind that, first of all, we've cleaned the hammer, but the hammer part never touches the fish. It's only gonna be touching the crust. So we're gonna crack it open, and I'm gonna kinda pull up the foil a little bit to sorta maybe cut down on the mess a little. And you can certainly hear how crusty that is. So when you pull the fish from the oven, it does need to rest for about 10 minutes. You might even want to let it rest a little bit longer because it's really, really hot. Um, I stopped and let it rest a bit more and now I'm going to continue. We're going to be pulling off the skin and pulling away more of that salt crust. Much cooler than it was. I'm happy about that. I actually kind of like to work with the skin while it's here. And then we'll pull that first layer of fish off. I'm not going to worry about going too far towards the tail or towards the head. 
And if I do it properly, we should be able to leave the bone and just pull some of the fish. I'll grab my spatula. Work its way under. I'm feeling the bone. I'm not digging into it. I'm gonna pull some of it over on my beautiful plate here with the fresh thyme and lemon slices. So now we should be able to reach in and pull that bone. Look at that. Looks like a cartoon, right? Where's a cat when you want one? How's that? So now we've got a second layer of fish that we can pull away from that skin if we want to. And that lemon and fresh thyme gave it a nice fragrant um, aroma. Now there's a lot more meat that we could take our time to work on here. You certainly want don't to uh, make sure you get every bit of that. Um, but you can see it's a beautiful plate here with some lemon and some thyme. And now, um, as I like to tell people, never trust a chef that doesn't eat their own food. So let's taste it. Mmm. Heaven. Nice and tender. Done in our salt crust with our egg whites and our lemon and thyme slices. Chesapeake Bay rockfish just in the water a couple of days ago. I hope you'll try this recipe. Thanks for joining us today. Recipes from the heart of the home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafb.com. And visit Chef Tammy Brawley's website at greenkitchenrichmond.com. Virginia's seafood industry is one of the oldest in the nation, with sales topping half a billion dollars each year. Rockfish live in the Chesapeake Bay year-round. They're also known as striped bass or stripers, and for several decades the population was increasing in the bay. But beginning in 2004, rockfish harvest counts began to decline. In 2015, the Virginia Marine Resource Commission reduced the annual rockfish harvest by 25 percent, and the harvest limit was cut another 18 percent in 2020. Most sport fishermen are now allowed to catch only one striped bass per trip. Most farmers are ramping up for planting season now that spring is here. Ricky Gibson reports in the future, some producers may not have to wait for Mother Nature to change its calendar. Back in 1930, they played indoor basketball at the Harding Street Urban Agriculture Center. Now, researchers at Virginia State University are studying ways to grow indoor crops. We have the lights to simulate the sun. We can make it freezing cold in here or we can make it super hot. So depending on what plant we're growing, we give it the conditions that it likes best. And so right now we're using what's called a flood table. Uh, this was something new that we've put in. And of the growing systems, the flood tables are my favorite because you can literally grow anything in them. Because you can use a mix of hydroponics or traditional growing with, with soil. And so as you see, we have a mixture of both. Um, that allows us to do play with root crops like onions and garlic and carrots and things like that, as well as your other traditional hydroponic leafy greens, uh, leafy greens, tomatoes, those things do really well uh, as well as strawberries. Dr. Marcus Comer and another faculty member coordinate activities in the Ag Center, which is owned by the city of Petersburg. It's a busy place. VSU agriculture graduate students work on research projects. Community volunteers help plant the crops and care for the indoor and outdoor gardens. Aquaculture tanks provide both protein and nutrients for the hydroponic plants. The overall goal is to learn how to better grow crops indoors with the help of a community that needs better nutrition options. What we try to do here at the center is show citizens that you can do a year-round grow without on a shoestring budget. You don't need a huge facility and spend millions of dollars. You can, your garage, a room in your house, your, your patio, on a shoestring budget, you can do this in your house. If you have something that holds water and you cut some holes in that you can pump the water and drain the water out, you got a flood table. So you don't have to spend a lot of money to do that. Local farmers often donate supplies or plants to help the Ag Center. A local fish farmer provides tilapia for the aquaponics tanks. Even herbal plants have a place. Glennis Adams needed a place to store a late shipment of lavender plants last fall, 
and everyone at the community center will benefit this year, especially in the test kitchen that will be used for nutrition classes and for testing recipes. Of those 15 varieties of lavender that um, I do have on my farm, we have about eight here at the center that is being cared for by myself and the members here at the center until the spring. And so uh, with that, we're going to look at ways in which we can improve healthy eating um, with unique cooking outside of your traditional salt and your pepper and your, your basil, your regular herbs and spices that you use for cooking. We've got our kitchen, uh, that's new. We have uh, people lined up on a waiting list ready to use it because um, it's a commercial kitchen. We use it for cooking demonstrations. It's set up in a classroom format. Comer says many crops can be grown successfully in hydroponic trays or towers. Their own research combined with other studies have proven that. The Ag Center allows them to expand on that research as well as engage community members. Cabbage does very well hydroponically. Some of the cabbage that we grow here will stay here. Uh, some of it will be transferred to our outdoor gardens. Some of it will be sold. Um, we have a number of people that we are actually starting seedlings for now, and that has become an income stream for us. They come over and they learn how to, they help us plant, they harvest, and during the growing season when we get the outdoor gardens going, you really see a lot of people because they come through, they help, they help plant, they help harvest, and all that food is free. One of the goals of the center was to show that it's not that difficult to raise fresh produce, even in an urban area and to help residents learn how to cook healthy food. People are really interested. People want fresh food, and once they find out we're here, they come by, particularly the kids, because um, there's a lot of kids in this neighborhood. And so we have basketball courts behind us. Um, they're back there on the basketball courts. They know we're in here. They come in here to get tours. We give away seeds. We give away pots, and we we take advantage of having them here. And so they're not just here playing basketball, they, get, they come by and they learn something. What we're finding with lavender, and again, it does open our doors uh, for growing and learning, but many of our community uh, families may know uh, a little about other types of plants and how to use them. It's just that they need just a little bit of help, just a little bit of encouragement, and then they can just take off from there and they can realize, ah, you know, I have an alternative here. Both the scientists who work there and the volunteers that assist them view the Harding Street Urban Agriculture Center as a different kind of community center, one that is growing both food and community roots. To learn more about the Harding Street Urban Agriculture Center, visit their webpage at www.ext.vsu.edu forward slash Harding dash ST dash project. In Petersburg, Virginia, I'm Ricky Gibson reporting. We're so glad you could join us this week to celebrate all the bounty Virginia has to offer. From the kitchen to your home and garden to our beautiful wide open spaces, we are proud to say that this is Real Virginia. For everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a great week. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always. There are 30,000 roadway accidents each year involving cars and farm machinery. Farmers will be moving equipment for planting and harvest season. The slow-moving vehicle triangle in red and fluorescent orange colors and flashing lights allow for quick identification. Motor vehicle safety starts with you.